Good evening, and welcome to the show. Now, before we go any further, there are two things I have to tell you. The first is that this show is recorded, which means that I'm not actually here at the moment. Uh, I'm at home watching the show, and, and so is the audience here. Oh, on the other hand, uh, perhaps they're not because they've already seen it once, so they're probably around the pub. <laughs> or, uh, or doing something quite different, uh, depending on what time they go to bed. Now, of course, when you record a show, you are able to edit it. That is, cut out bits that are too long or, or bits that aren't very good. Mind you, it's a very skilled job, this editing. You see, if it's not done just right, you get odd things happening to the picture. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, luckily, we've got a very good editor, so that's not likely to happen. <laughs> now, hands up those of you who've never been to a television studio before. Quite a lot of you. Well, <clears throat> I should explain that not all the show is done in the studio. Some of it is filmed. Now, here again, editing's very essential. It means that one minute I'm in the studios talking to you, and the next minute I'm sitting in a country lane dressed as a yokel with a beautiful girl. The <laughs> advantage of being on film is that you can bump into yourself in the street. <laughs> morning, George. Morning, Constable Harris. Ah. Then, when you want to go back to the studio, the editor simply cuts the film and... Uh, there you are. Uh. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> now, that part of it is all fairly easy. The difficult thing about doing a show is deciding what it's going to be about. However, I think we've managed to solve that problem. Uh, this show isn't going to be about anything. But, as it happens, while we were rehearsing it, we did notice that all the items in the show were connected with a particular month in the year. So, if it's any help to you, we're going to start at January and work our way through to December. Mind you, we may not do all the months, it depends on how much time we've got. I thought I'd better mention that because we are running a bit short of time and the editor might make a cut here, in which case I could very easily disappear in the... lad was far from home a fighting at the wars to win the day for dear old England's name. They'd sent him off to Africa to battle with the Boers to do his best though he was not to blame. He thought of his old mother dear sitting all alone at supper and a lump came to his throat. He took a pen and paper to send a letter home and his eyes were filled with tears as he wrote. Shed me a lump of your old black pudding and stuff it all up most. Send me a lump of your old black pudding and a slab of dripping toast. We're fighting to make this old world good enough for folks who really care. So send me a lump of your old black pudding and I'll know that you're still A Scottish lad was over there and he was fighting too and thinking of his homeland far away. He thought of all the things his darling Maggie used to do as they wandered through the heather on the prey. And then a dreadful longing seemed to fill his Scottish heart as he pictured Maggie sitting by the fire. And he wrote these simple words to her, although we're far apart, there is really only one thing I desire. 
Send me a lump of your tea, you know. That is, well, that is what I'm craving for the new. If I could just get my hands on your dear old haggis, I would know that you're still true. I've never seen a haggis like my sweet young Maggie's, and although I'm far from him, just send me a lump of your dear old haggis, and I'll know you feel the same. An Irish boy lay wounded in the camp that very night But the suffering and pain he bravely bore And he watched the others writing And he wished that he could write To his colleague back on dear old Erin's shore Send me a parcel of Irish steel, dear Wrap it up and send it piping hot If I could just get me bread in your Irish steel, dear Then I'd know you've not forgot there's nobody nearly as good as you, dear, with your cater and your meat. So send me a parcel of Irish steel, dear, and the night will be complete. I want to pinch your van. What? Where? Here. No one's pinching me van. My name is Brightwell. How do you do? Is it all right for me to answer? Yes. <laughs> How do you do? And this, I assume, is your accountant? Yes, Mr. Nodron. Happy new financial year to you. Oh, please sit down, gentlemen. Now, <sighs> oh, Mr. Grimwade, I have your tax return here. <laughs> and there are one or two items that I would like to query. He filled it in. Keep calm, he's bluffing. Uh, now, um, Mr. Grimwade, are you married? Uh, no. Yes. <laughs> uh, when my client says no, he's not married, he means by that yes, he is, don't you? Uh, yes. Yeah. Of course. Uh, children? Eight. <laughs> Three. 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 Names? What? The names of your children. Um, George. Uh, Bernard. And Shaw. <laughs> Shaw? Positive. <laughs> Bernard, Shaw, and who? George. Uh, yes, George. Right, dependents. Uh, no. No, except his, uh, except his parents. But both my parents are, uh, uh, are alive. <laughs> and kicking. <laughs> Right. Income. Five. Five what? Five hundred. Five hundred thousand. <laughs> Five thousand. <laughs> pounds. Five thousand pounds. Five thousand pounds. And now, these expenses... 
it's going to be all right. <laughs> I see you claim the whole of the rent for your home as office rent. Yeah, yes. Don't you live at home at all? Uh, no, my client, uh, my client lives in a tent uh, at the bottom of his office garden. Yeah. With his wife? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not married. <laughs> two, eight, girl, who likes living in houses? I'm not married to a girl who likes living in houses. <laughs> I think I'm beginning to understand now. Um, entertainment expenses, £2,400. Mr. Grimway, you are aware that you may claim entertainment expenses only for entertaining foreign businessmen? Uh, yes, well, they were foreign. Welsh. <laughs> the Welsh are not foreign. No, I was saying, oh, uh, well, Chinese. <laughs> Chinese, yes. Yet you may think it rather strange that my client entertains Chinese business when, uh, men when, in fact, he, uh, he manufactures cricket bats. But after all, this was an attempt to open up what could be a very big market. Of course, hence the travel expenses, £2,800. Mr. Grimway, travel well? Uh, China. And where in China? Peking. What? Now, I would like uh, Mr. Grimway to answer this on his own, please. Mr. Grimway, without any help, where in China? <laughs> Barking. <laughs> is in Essex. Dogs. Isle of dogs. Isle of Chinese dogs. Look, look, look now. Look now is in India. Yes, we used to pass through there on our way to uh, Cap, Cap, Capri, Capri, Isle of Capri. Italy, Italy. Yes, Cap, yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, what? Three syllables. Three syllables. <laughs> peak, 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 peak. Knee, peak, knee, peak in knees, 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 peak in Uh, you did say you were married, didn't you? Uh, yes. You didn't nod your head then? I did not nod my head. Uh, what were your children's names again? Uh, Robert, Louis and Stevens. What happened? <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, I can't carry on. It's all lies. Uh, I've been out of work for a year. It's all lies. Christmas and living in a tent in the garden of China. Here's my accountant. He came round to my house and he broke in. He forced me to come round to his house. He told me all the usual lies. I was out of work for a year. It's all lies. I've been out of work for a year. It's all lies. He's forced me to come round to his house and he broke in. He forced me to come round to his house and he broke in. He forced me to come round to his house and he broke in. He forced me to come round to his house and he broke in. He forced me to come round to his house and he broke in. He forced me to come round to his house and he broke in. He forced me to come round to his house and he broke in. He forced me to come round to his house and he broke in. He forced me to come round to Cigarette. No, oh, thank you. Look, if he's been unemployed the whole year, he doesn't have any tax to pay anyway, so why do you force him to come round here and tell me these lies about Chinese and cricket bats and living in a tent? It's my job. you could come up and see me. Come a little closer, why don't you? Mmm, that's enough. How's about giving me a tickle in A-flat, honey? Oh. My first name's May, and my second name is West. I'm the kind of shady lady who'll put hairs upon your chest. Now, some folks say I'm overweight, but take a tip from me. Life begins at 47. 37, 43. No me. I've got a little penthouse where I'm nearly always pent. Well, it's really just a bedroom, but at least it pays the rent. I'm working on my latest book. I write from six till ten. So pop in if you've an inkling, and I'll fill your fountain pen. Oh, good fate. My past is all behind me. I'm reformed, as you can see. My motto once was love for sale, but now I give it free. Come up to my apartment and I'll drive away your cares. But you'd better be in training. It's up 14 flights of stairs. That's why nobody comes up and sees me no more. Oh, my.
Good evening. The Spoonerism. Today marks the 127th anniversary of the birth of the Reverend William Archibald Spooner of New College, Oxford. Born July the 22nd, 1844. The clergyman who became famous for his inadvertent verbal transpositions. The man who more than once declared from the pulpit that the Lord is a shoving leopard. <laughs> the man who, proposing a toast to Queen Victoria, rose from the table and exclaimed, Glaze your rasses to the queer old dean. <laughs> a new play opens this month at the Adam Faith Memorial Theatre. <laughs> it deals with the home life of the man who invented the spoonerism. Here is a short extract. There you are, William. Beautiful day, isn't it? Quite so, my dear. The shine is sunning, the churds are burping, lovers are killing and booing. <laughs> it makes one glide to be a lamb. <laughs> well, you're in a good mood, because look what the laundry did to your best shirt. Great heavens, they freed the slaves. <laughs> freed the slaves, dear. I did that, said and I. They put them toward the collar and smashed all the buttons. Quite so. Collar, buttons and sleeves at one swell foop. I shall fight them, Nathan Tail. Nathan Tool. I'll go down there. I'll go and smith them to smasherines. Excuse me, dear, while I tump into a jacksie. <laughs> Surely such a scene would be unseemly to a man in your calling. You are quite right, my dear. After all, I am a clan of the moth. I will let sleeping logs die. To hew is ermine. Which reminds me, did my handkerchiefs come back? All last night I had a terrible rosy nun. <laughs> there, a nosy run. Running nose. So did I. Oh, there you are, dear. Oh, thank you, my dear. <laughs> ah. Do you feel like some breakfast, William? Oh, indeed, I do. <laughs> I think I shall start with some hot toted bust. <laughs> Followed by a rasher of streaky beacon <laughs> and some of that cereal which goes pap, snockle, and crap. Very good. And while you're eating it, I shall pack my things. Pack your pings, dear. Yes, William, you see, I'm leaving you. Leaving me? After 20 years of bedded whiss? <laughs> this surely must be some form of jethetic poke. <laughs> You surely can't mean to destroy my entire lay of wife. I'm not quite serious, William. I'm leaving and I'm not coming back. No, but my dear, consider the words of the highly bobble. <laughs> Whom God hath joined together, let no son put a man up. <laughs> I mean, uh, let no man put a sand up. Oh, I'm getting my tongue all tangled. Ah, I got that one right. I'm sorry about that. William, that's why I'm leaving you. Leaving me? What can you mean? It's quite simple. I can't spoon any more standardisms. <laughs> Owing to the shortage of newsreaders during the holiday period, the news this week is being read by your regular newsreader from his holiday resort on the south coast. Over now to Little Hampton, Sussex, Mrs. Ivy Hawkes, News at Nine, Hanwell, Middlesex. <laughs> Good morning. Here is the beach. The sandcastle disaster. There is still no trace of the two sandcastles which disappeared during the night. An exhaustive search is still being carried out. An official spokesman said, there always comes a time when the tide must turn. The price of deck chairs has risen dramatically since yesterday by almost 15%, according to a report issued by my good lady. The increases took effect as from this morning and bring the cost of a single deck chair to four new pence. The manufacturers say they should now remain steady, but a complete collapse cannot be ruled out. <laughs> there was an accident on the promenade today, involving a fat lady and a handcart full of bananas. <laughs> the 
that lady was unharmed, but one banana received fatal injury. <laughs> Next to skin had been important. <laughs> the milk dispute at Seaview Guest House is now into its fourth day. Guests have complained that milk supplies are insufficient to cover their crispies. <laughs> Mrs. Scraggs, the management, has so far refused to give an inch, stating that, in her opinion, half an inch is ample. She added that there may very well be a return to porridge by the weekend. An official ruling on toast was called for, and it was eventually declared black. <laughs> a warm front is now approaching from the west. covered quite a large area <laughs> uh, in a later bulletin. <clears throat> and now, a report from our air correspondent. <laughs> now to the local news, which I filmed earlier this morning. First, news of a happy event. Priscilla the donkey has given birth. Mother and ass are both doing well. The annual Walking Backwards contest, organised by the Daily Mail in association with the Borough Council, now in its eighth day, attracted a large number of entrants. Although very few people turned out to watch, competition was keen and many entrants, though hesitant at first, soon got into their stride. Here we see two of the favourites. The contest was eventually won by Miss Doreen Picklethwaite, seen here on the left and right of the picture. <laughs> and that is the end of this news bulletin. Ah. I... Here is a late piece of film, uh, which has just come back from the chemist. The Sandcastle mystery has apparently been solved. Woman Police Constable Johnson spent the morning setting up decoys and the culprit was finally caught red-handed. Baby pleaded guilty and asked for seven other sandcastles, an ice cream cornet, and a coach driver's stomach to be taken into consideration. <laughs> now, over to Jack Armstrong's legs for the weather. Good evening to you and what a beautiful evening it is now if you remember last week I was talking to you about indoor plants and although October is a month when we should be out in the garden I would just like to finish off with what I was showing you we were doing with our little plastic bags now if you remember uh, this is how we wrapped it up now this plant you see it's been in the airing cupboard uh, all the week very little light uh, and of course we sealed it round the bottom so that the air in the bag remains the same and of course absolutely no water at all dry and, and airless now we'll uh, we'll just have a look at it <laughs> take that off and there it is absolutely <laughs> uh, well so much for that now, uh, if you remember, uh, last week I was going to talk to those people, this week I was going to talk to those people who, who haven't yet caught the gardening bug, uh, apart from Mrs. Wheeler of Nottingham, and I'll be sending you some grey ointment, Mrs. Wheeler. But for those of you who haven't yet started a garden, just take a look at this. It's often said that an Englishman's home is his castle. Well, you know, that may very well be true, but to my mind, just as important as the house is the garden. I mean, just look at those. <laughs> Any gardener would be proud to have them in his garden, and you can pick them up for next to nothing. Well, of course, we may not all have gardens like this one, but most of us have got a little bit of ground at the back of the house, so why not set to and see what can be done? <laughs> You'll be surprised how it will soon develop. And may I say straight away that tidiness is one of the first rules of gardening. 
so get rid of those leaves. Weeds are a gardener's worst enemy. Luckily, effective weed killers can now be obtained, but when spraying, accuracy is essential, as they will kill anything they touch. <laughs> All gardens need watering, and this must be done regularly. So set aside a certain time each week and stick to it, whatever happens. In addition to watering, and a garden hose is a must for lawns and flower beds, make sure you get plants that will flower at different times throughout the year. In a well-planned garden, no matter what the season, there's always something to look at. <laughs> Incidentally, do look after your garden hose. Don't leave it lying about in the garden, otherwise it'll become perished. And when you next go to use it, you'll be in for a nasty shock. When designing a garden, try planting shrubs in pots or tubs. These can be easily moved around to give a pleasant view from a window. But do choose a hardy variety, nothing too delicate. <laughs> and now, a very important point, fencing. There's an old saying, good fences make good neighbours, and by golly, that's true. So while you're going about your other duties in the garden, make sure you keep a weather eye open for any gaps or holes in the fencing which might cause annoyance to your next door neighbour, as this could lead to all sorts of trouble. So remember, just as you love your wife and care for her, so you must love your garden, and you will find they're both a source of pleasure all the year round. Because after all, gardening is like marriage. You plant a little seed of affection, tend it with loving care, and in the due season of the year, nature will take its course. Remember, remember the 5th of November, Gunpowder, Treason and Plot. Tonight, for the first time on any television screen, BBC proudly presents its miracle machine, TT1.
By using this amazing new invention, the result of years of research and a miracle of technological achievement, we are able to actually travel in time, hence the name TT1, and witness events as they happened in history. Tonight, we are taking you to the trial of Guido Fawkes, better known as Guy Fawkes, the man who, regretfully, some people would say, failed to blow up the Houses of Parliament. At present, the TT1 is only able to deal with one specific period of time. If we had two machines, we could have shown you the actual cellars where the attempt took place. As the head of programs remarked, oh, what a pity we've only one TT. <laughs> However, it is the trial itself that we shall be seeing tonight, live as it really happened over 300 years ago. Waiting in the courtroom is our commentator. So over now, across the centuries to Robin Day. Good evening, and may I say, first of all, what a remarkable feeling it is to be speaking to you in the year of 1605. My journey here on the TT was not uneventful, for although the journey took, in fact, less than a second of actual time, the machine broke down in 1673, and I was stranded for nine hours without food. Luckily, I ran into Nell Gwynne and was able to avail myself of her oranges. <laughs> now, to the trial. The court is already in session, as you can see. The prisoner is about to be brought in. Bring in the prisoner! Bring in the prisoner! <laughs> Silence in court! The prisoner at the bar! You are the man known as Guy Fawkes? No, Your Honor. What? Guy Fawkes, Your Honor. <laughs> You're a gentleman? No, I'm a songwriter. Boozy and Fawkes, songs for every occasion. Isn't it? <laughs> I see. Already we have an interesting disparity here between the history books and events as they actually were. This man is in fact a Welshman, Di Fawkes. Silence in court! And not, as hitherto understood, a Spaniard. Also the fact that he writes songs... Silence! I'm terribly sorry, I'm sorry. Now... <laughs> Prisoner of the bar, you're accused of trying to blow up the Houses of Parliament. How do you plead? I can't begin to tell you. Is that a plea? No, it's a song. I can't begin to tell you how much you mean to me. Silence. Silence. This is most irregular. Well, I'm sorry, Your Honor, but I've got songs on the brain, isn't it? Are you telling me that you can, you can only speak in song titles? Yes. We have no bananas. <laughs> that will do. Now, what is your partner's name? Oh, Monty Boozy, Your Honor. Known as Miniscule Monty, the musical midget. Bring on the... Monty the Midget. Bring Monty the Midget. The first witness is a circus performer known to be a close friend of the prisoners. Silence in court. He appears to be in call for the prosecution. Is he about to betray his colleague Guy Fawkes or is he merely... You there! Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What is your name? Um, Robin Day, Your Honor. Make a note of that name, clerk of the court. If you interrupt again, Master Day, you will be expelled from this court. Do you understand? I don't <laughs> Call Monty the Midget. Monty the Midget. <laughs> you are Monty the Midget. That is correct. Aren't you rather tall for a midget? How dare you? Us midgets don't like people making comments about our right. <laughs> Who is this fellow you've got with you? Well, uh, I'm his accountant, Your Honor. His accountant? Uh, yes. What business is your client in? Uh, the snow business. The snow business? The snow business! Silence! Silence! I will not have any more singing in this court. Is that understood? Take them away. Mr. Justice Coke. Mr. Justice Coke is obviously a man with an enormous... Uh, Fox! Uh, yes, I'm sorry. You are Welsh? Yes, that's right, Your Honour, yes. My family have lived in the Welsh mountains for generations. And we are pleased to be called, as we have always been called, the folks who live on the hill. That will do, that will do. Now, you admit to being concerned in this plot. No, 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 no. I was only employed to lay the fuses. Sort of subcontracted, isn't it? Ah, but you were caught red-handed moving some kindling wood. Well, I had to because of my jelly. Your jelly? A jelly night. Oh, yes. Yes, you see, someone had dropped this wood, and it was all over my jelly, see? I beg your pardon? It was all over my jelly, see? <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, 
I take it that you know a lot about fuses. You oh, definitely. If you knew fuses, like I know fuses. Oh, 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 Silence in court. A surprising twist to the case. Fawkes is apparently only a hard stooge. If only my old history master were here today, it sucks boo to him for a start off. <laughs> master Day? Yes, Your Honor. What are you doing? Are you trying to set fire to this court? Good heavens, no, Your Honor. I don't want to set the court on fire. I just want a drag from a pipe full of shag. <laughs> It is my impression, sir, that you are not what you seem. Perhaps you are behind this whole pot. You come into this court wearing strange apparel, obviously disguised. You disrupt the proceedings by talking to yourself. And now you produce fire and smoke under my very nose. Uh, he's the one, Your Honor. That's the man there. He gave me the orders. I just carried them out, eh? Orders, eh? What were these orders? Roll out the barrel. They will have a barrel of guns. Roll out. The battle. There is a job to be done. See, So, arrest that man. No, no, I protest. I'm from the BBC. Robin Day. You are the one. <laughs> it was you beneath the crypt, but now you're undone. If you made that great big boom, you can blow up all the council room and the king would go to King of Kong. Robin Day, he got inside of me. Think of that building burning just takes the height of me. So I sentence you, my lord, you're condemned to spend your life making sparkles for gunfire night. Robin Day! Robin Day, returning you to the 20th century. Nearly done, have you? Yes. Yes, I'm nearly done. But it's been hard. Terribly, terribly hard. It doesn't seem a year ago since I toddled in here, just like you. I thought it was all going to be so easy. But it was hard. God, it was hard. Oh, I don't know, Ronnie. It wasn't a bad little show. I mean, you know, perhaps a few girls might have made a bit of a difference. Oh, you think so? Well, I, I think... Think so. 